Welcome back to another one of our videos from our Winter Ecology series. This is part two, and we're going to be talking today a little bit about physical adaptations that animals have to survive winter. There's quite a few of really, really interesting ones, so I'm excited for you to um, join me in learning a bit about this today. So we have a couple of creatures, winter creatures here, porcupine and mountain goats, who are actually very well adapted for winter. Um, but there's many more we're going to be talking about today. And if there's any that you're super interested in about that I didn't have a chance to talk about today, please let us know and maybe we can talk a little bit more about them in a future video. So a lot of, a lot of winter creatures will have what are essentially snowshoes. And when we go out in the snow and it's really, really deep, we have to put those snowshoes on to make sure we don't sink all the way down to our, our knees or or after our hips and try to wade through that snow. And if, if you've ever tried it, you know how much work that really is. It would be a waste of energy. It'd be really hard to get away from prey. It'd be really hard to go after prey. So animals have to adapt that, that snowy, uh, that, that barrier to movement, that snow. So we have a couple different creatures here. Um, all of these uh, animals have essentially these snowshoes. On the very left, we have a ptarmigan. Now, ptarmigan, you can see they have those really bumpy uh, calluses, calluses almost on their, on their feet that allows them to grip things, even though it might be icy, slippery. Um, they also have a lot of uh, fur on their feet, or sorry, hair, but feathers. There we go. Lots of feathers on their feet, which allows them to keep their feet a little bit warmer. Now, caribou, moose, snowshoe, hares, lynx, bobcats, wolves, they're all examples of animals that have very well adapted feet for winter that helps them stay on top of the snow and stay warm. So if you look at the wolf over here, we can't really see their toes so well, but um, you can kind of see the bristly hairs around them. And if you've ever had a chance to look at uh, some different breeds of dogs, they also have fairly similar feet. Now, wolf toes, those with those stiff bristly hairs actually um, help them with insulation and traction. Um, they have blood vessels that keep their foot pads just above the freezing point, and their toe pads are made from a fatty tissue which has a lower freezing point than other fats in their bodies. Um, now at night, wolves will curl up with their tails around their noses and their feet, and they will retain the warm air from their lungs that they've just exhaled and essentially recycle it as a foot warmer. So that helps to make sure that their extremities don't get super, super cold. If you've ever had conversations about hypothermia or how to dress appropriately for winter, how to make sure you're staying safe out there, a lot of times they will talk about making sure you're protecting your extremities, your fingers and your toes, because those are the, hot, the farthest regions from our core where most of our heat is. So they're the most at danger for damage from that cold. Now, moose and caribou feet, if you look at the picture at the top there, you can kind of see the foot spreading out a little bit over the snow. Um, moose, caribou, they both have hooves that spread out over the snow, which helps them stay above the snow, even though they have uh, fairly small feet for their body. Now, moose also have another adaptation that helps them quite a bit. They have extremely flexible legs, and I'd recommend you go look up a video of a, a moose running, maybe turn it to slow-mo. It's very fascinating. And you can see them, how high they're actually lifting their legs as they're running through the snow um, or running through a swamp or a wetland, right? They, uh, they can lift their legs so high out of the snow that that snow really doesn't become a barrier for their movement as much. Um, it's thought that this adaptation was originally evolved to help them uh, move through wetlands. All right. And of course, our felines as well, our bobcats and our lynx, they have those really big feet that spread out. You can really see it in this picture here, um, which allow them to distribute their weight across the snow so they don't fall into the snow um, and they can very uh, gracefully go after their prey. On to our next adaptation. Now, camouflage allows a lot of animals to make sure they stay safe through the winter. 
Um, what's pretty fascinating about a lot of these uh, animals is that they are able to change their coat. Um, so the stoat we have on the far left there, also called an ermine or a short-tailed weasel. Um, least weasels and long-tailed weasels can also change color. Um, we have a white-tailed ptarmigan at the bottom of the page there. Um, willow and rock ptarmigans also change color. And we have a white-tailed jackrabbit. Um, and the snowshoe hair we saw on the previous slide also change color. Now, these animals grow an entirely new coat of uh, fur or feathers uh, over the winter. And it doesn't just help them with camouflage. It actually is better insulating, both because of the change in density of their fur, so how closely packed those hairs are, and the change in color. Now, you might be thinking, why, does, why would white fur help them be warmer? Right. If you uh, if you were hiking on a really hot day and you wore a black T-shirt, you're going to be a lot warmer than if you're hiking with a white T-shirt on. That's because that white T-shirt is, is reflecting the light, whereas the black T-shirt is absorbing it. However, there's something else going on here that makes the white fur um, a little bit warmer for these creatures, actually a lot warmer for these creatures. So brown hair or, or this more colored, more pigmented hair is filled with the proteins that make those pigments. Whereas white fur doesn't have those pigments. And instead, there's air in the spaces where those pigments would be. Now this trapped air actually provides additional insulation. It's air that can be heated up with the, uh, the heat radiating from the body of the animal. And retained is not being blown away because it's trapped inside the, the hair itself. Now, a snowshoe hare's uh, winter coat is actually 27% more insulating than its summer coat. So this is a pretty effective method to help them survive the winter. Stoats also have another interesting adaptation with their camouflage. Um, they have a tiny little bit of black uh, coloring still left on the very end of their tails. And this helps them to evade predators. Now, why would a little bit of coloration help them to get rid of predators instead of going full white so they totally blend in with the snow. Well, they figure that, well, <laughs> that's definitely the wrong way of putting it. Uh, this adaptation evolved because it allowed them to uh, dodge the, the main predatory attempt of uh, one of their predators that's, that's going after them. So the predator would see the black on their tail and target that instead of the main body of the weasel. So it's much better to lose a tail than your life. Um, so this helps them survive. However, they're also able to move their tails pretty fast. So if the animal goes after the tail, you may not have much of a chance of actually catching the tail. So it's a pretty, pretty cool adaptation. All right, moving on to our next adaptation, we have this collection of really, really, really cute creatures. What makes them so cute? Well, they're really, really round with really short extremities, round bodies and short limbs. Now there's a fancier way we can say this, a more scientific way we can say this, they have a low surface to volume ratio. And I think my video might be covering just a little bit of that slide there, so I'll move it off to the side. There we go. Um, so why would a low surface area to volume ratio be good? So they have very little surface ratio or surface area compared to what their volume is. And this actually is a, um, a fairly repeatable trait that we see in adaptations to uh, colder climates. Um, what this allows them to do is reduce the heat loss that they experience. So on this page, we have a white-tailed ptarmigan, a field wool, uh, a pika, and the snowshoe hair. When you're, when you're cold, what is your instinct? Do you spread out your limbs and stretch out, or do you pull all your limbs really, really close and kind of huddle up? Well, you would probably huddle up if you were cold. Now, that's one way we can limit the amount of surface area that's actually exposed to the external environment, exposed to the weather. Um, as you head north, two things happen to animal shapes. Animals tend to get larger towards the polar regions of the earth, 
and they tend to have low surface area to volume ratios like these animals here. So this reduces the heat dissipation from that animal, just like we kind of instinctually do ourselves when we tuck ourselves into a little ball when we're cold, reduces that heat loss. And it makes for some really cute animals. All right. Now we also have these really fabulous thick winter coats that we see on quite a few different animals. Um, now, a lot of animals will grow this extra thick coat of feathers or fur in the fall and then shed it again in the spring. While well, some animals grow an entirely new coat of fur, uh, many animals actually just grow additional fur or increase the density of their fur. Beavers, red foxes, coyotes, mink, fishers, river otters, martens, and weasels all increase the density of their fur. And I'm sure there's many, many, many more, um, but I'm not going to list all the animals that do that. Uh, porcupines will grow a fuzzy under fur underneath their quills. Um, and deer and moose will change their hair structure when they molt to their winter coat. They will replace the solid hairs with hollow hairs. Um, similar to what those animals did earlier that changed to uh, uh, camouflage. Um, now this, of course, increases the fur's insulative properties. Wolves and polar bears also have hollow hair. And animals kind of balance the benefits and costs of these adaptations. Thick fur can impact their agility um, and the ability to squish into small, safe hiding places or go after prey that's just squished into those small, safe hiding places. We've got a lynx here on the right and we've got a snowy owl there on the left. And you can also see on their feet as well, they have those snowshoe adaptations. Uh, they have very hairy feet to help keep them warm or very uh, feathery feet to help keep them warm. Now, this one is um, a little bit more difficult to see. You'd have to actually study um, using either imaging techniques um, or, or look into a book that's already done it um, to be able to see if an animal has this adaptation. Now, in our own arm, and you can kind of see in this image here, there's the picture of the hand there with um, our circulatory system going through. Now it's a bit simplified, um, but you can see how those two um, veins separate. Um, so the vein and the artery are split. Now, because of that, those two different uh, vessels aren't able to exchange heat. However, in animals that have countercurrent exchange, those veins and arteries are side by side. So they're actually able to transfer heat. And now but you can kind of see where the term comes from. So we've got one current going this way and one current going the other, other way. So one current out towards the extremities and one current back towards the core of the animal. And those currents that are going in counter, countering directions, they're exchanging heat between them. Now this allows for a couple of things. It, in the end, the hand, the extremity will um, essentially experience colder, um, uh, colder blood. So their extremity will be colder. However, uh, a lot of times our bodies will reduce circulation to our extremities because of uh, potential for heat loss. So if we have all this warm blood going to our hands and our hands aren't very well protected, we don't have a lot of insulation around them, that heat's going to be lost. So the hands will end up being just as, they'll be freezing, they'll be just as cold. Um, and the blood that would be going back into the body would be really, really cold blood. And now that would start to affect your core temperature. And that's really what we're worried about here. That's really the adaptation, uh, why the adaptation has been so successful. Um, as the blood in these situations goes back to the body and we have this counter current exchange, heat exchange, the heat from the blood going out to the extremity is shared with the cold blood that's coming back in. So the core body temperature doesn't get affected as much. Now, oftentimes the extremities of these animals are um, made of different proteins or different tissues uh, that allow them to withstand the colder temperature without damage, right? 
um, but this one's pretty fantastic. Wolves, geese, a number of other winter animals all have this counter current heat exchange. Unfortunately, we don't, so we can get really, really cold hands and we have to watch out for hypothermia. Um, now, I'm gonna jump into one of my favorites and unfortunately, I'm gonna keep this one very short today, but if you guys are all very interested in learning a bit more about insects and how they overwinter or different invertebrates and how they overwinter, please let us know. We'd be, uh, I'd be super excited to talk more about it. And I know we all at the Weasel Head would love to share some more um, information with you about these really incredible critters that you can find in the park. Now, many insects overwinter in resistant life stages. So a lot of invertebrates go through metamorphosis and they'll change uh, very, very significantly throughout the different stages of their life. And so there will often be one stage of their life that is more tolerant to the conditions experienced in winter. For example, the woolly bear caterpillar will overwinter as a larva. That's the one we see at the bottom here with the orange and black bristles, uh, the fur almost coming off of it. Um, and they will overwinter in leaf litter. Um, some insects will produce glycerol, which acts as an antifreeze. It uh, lowers their, uh, their body's freezing temperature, the, the point at which their tissues will freeze. Um, some species of dragonflies, mayflies, stoneflies will survive as nymphs in uh, the water beneath the ice over the winter. Um, they'll feed and grow and continue to be active throughout the winter and then emerge in the spring as adults. Some insects will overwinter as eggs, some as pupa, such as moths in the silkworm family, that's uh, Saturnidae, and uh, they will often remain attached to the branches of plants. Now, quite a few will overwinter as adults including ladybugs in leaf litter. You can see that big pic uh, that picture of all the, uh, the big collection of ladybugs on the left there. Now, this is a really good reason to make sure you don't rake off your lawn in the winter. The, the protection of the leaves on the grass will provide an incredible habitat for a lot of these creatures that use that as their main method to survive winter. So without the leaf litter, it could really impact these populations and their ability to survive. Now, a lot of times we might think, what, there, there can't be that many uh, invertebrates hiding in here, but if you, uh, if you do give it a try, I want you to go adventuring in the spring and see uh, just how many ladybugs you can find in your own lawn uh, once the snow melts. Um, it's quite amazing. It's really, really phenomenal to see. Um, now, morning cliff butterflies will hibernate, essentially. And I, I do that with quotations because um, it's not quite the right term. Uh, they go through diapause. Um, and they will hibernate or go through diapause in tree holes over the winter, so the state of dormancy. They will produce glycerol and reduce the water content in their body. So now there's less water to freeze at all. Um, honeybees will stay in their hive and they will actually rotate positions in the hive and they will vibrate to generate heat. Now the bees in the very center of the hive, they're surrounded by other bees. So they're kind of in the warmest section of the hive and eventually it'll be their turn to be exposed to the colder temperatures and they'll move to the outside and vibrate because they have all this energy because they got to rest a little bit when they were there cozy in the center of the hive. Now, uh, early in the spring, uh, the, some of these bees will start to leave their hive, but they won't go for very long because if their body temperature was to drop too much, they wouldn't be allowed back in the hive because they would start to be a danger to the rest of the hive. So we have to make sure their trips out are very, very quick and they get back before they get too cold. Oh, and sorry, there's one more I wanted to point out on this, this screen here. On the right there, we see a plant, right? We see a, see a plant that kind of has something that, hmm, does that look almost like a, a like an onion, a garlic? Um, but what that is, is plant tissue that has been modified 
by an animal, by an invertebrate, by an insect, uh, to grow into a home for a creature over the winter. So this is a goldenrod plant. Uh, the goldenrod fly will lay its eggs into the branch or into the stem of the goldenrod plant and grow this gall. So this gall is entirely made of plant, uh, plant tissue, natural plant tissue um, that's been stimulated by um, mimicking hormones that the uh, egg produces that's been laid inside the stem of the goldenrod plant. And so the egg will grow and pupate and eventually come out in the spring, bore through the, the gall to the outside and live its adult life before it itself lays an egg in another goldenrod plant. So these galls are also a really, really good way for these animals to survive through winter conditions. And it's really hard for, for birds and other predators to actually get to these insects. All right, now this one's really, really fast. So please feel free to pause this page if you want to explore this list a little bit more. Um, on the top right, we have some harvestmen, which aren't actually spiders, but they do look a lot like spiders. Um, they are um, an invertebrate that likes to gather into big clumps, big groups over the winter um, so that they can kind of share their warmth and, and survive together until the spring arrives. Um, we also have some Corixidae or water boatmen. Um, this picture is from the Glenmore Reservoir in early March. So they're some of the first invertebrate to, invertebrate to be active um, once the snow melts. And we also have a dragonfly nymph, and you can kind of see it there. It's blended in really, really well um, with its environment. All right, I'm going to be moving on from this one. So if you want to pause it, now's the time. All right. Oh, unfortunately, that's everything for today. So I hope you come back. This is, I suppose, a teaser page. Um, we will be doing another video very soon. Um, so watch out for winter ecology part three. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about behavioral adaptations, um, but I hope you all enjoyed learning about some of those physical adaptations that animals have to winter. Thank you very much. And come check out some of our programs with the Weaselhead Glenmore Park Preservation Society. We will have lots of hikes going on. We have school programs and we have field trips. So uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Bye.